Hello, everyone. I'm here again doing another interview, with, um, particularly for the Circumcision Harms docu-series. And uh, right now I have Robin Sanders with me. So Robin, um, please introduce yourself and uh, let us know how you got involved in all this. Uh, hello, my name is Robin. Um, I got involved um, when I was pregnant with my son. Um, I know a lot of people um, they don't really think much about it. They just think it's just what you do. So that's pretty much how I, I thought about it until someone in um, one of my due date groups, pregnancy due date, they suggested that I uh, check out your whole baby and kind of look into that. And at first I was like, you know, whatever. Um, I'm still going to do it, but I'll at least I'll know more about it. Um, and then I was horrified when I was going through um, all of the information. And then, I don't know, I just, that's the first thing I've ever felt like really passionate about. Uh, I kind of just dove in. I was, I was probably reading information six to eight hours a day yeah. for the first few weeks. I wasn't sleeping. Like, it was hard to sleep. Mm -hmm. it was hard to think about anything other than um, circumcision and yeah. prevention. I, I just got done with an interview from with a guy from Germany and that was his, um, he, he expressed the same thing after he, 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 act, he kind of just by chance came across a video on FGM and he was so startled by it. Um, it kind of just sent him down the rabbit hole and uh, he ended up like one day did, or one time 48 hours, couldn't sleep or whatever because he was so stressed about it and all uh, that. And yeah, that's, that's a very common thing. And even uh, John Geisker on the American Circumcision documentary talks about how there's just so much stuff, you know, you get started on it, you just kind of, it just kind of sucks you in. <laughs> it's, it's like watching a, a train wreck about to happen, you just can't take your eyes off of it. Okay, so uh, I got a list of things. Uh, there's this list was really designed with my idea of talking to um, victims. Uh, and when I say victims, I'm talking about um, people that have been generally cut without consent and without a medical need. Um, so as I go over the, I'm going to go first start with going over the physical harms. And um, I don't imagine you experience these physical harms yourself because you're not a, a male that has been cut but you know you might have some ideas or questions or whatever about these as i go over them um feel free to you know speak up um put your two cents in because that's what we're here for is to get some different perspectives on this topic okay. and it's really interesting how there's so many different perspectives on this on this issue all right, so the first thing I have on the list for the physical um, harms is the acroposteon. And the reason why I put it there is because I guess supposedly during the biblical times um, when this cutting happened, I guess you know, for biblical reasons, they weren't cutting off everything that was covering the prep use. You know, this is right. my, my mom's penis and it you know, kind of shows how the intact penis is yeah. supposed to work. All right, um, and they only cut off the the acroposteon, the, the part that hangs past the, the glands. And, um, and I think that's where they came up with the term foreskin. You know, it's a, the skin that's for the penis, before the penis, right? So somewhere along the way, they started cutting out a lot more and that's the cold. Uh, then you have, I, I have sensitive skin on the list um, and I bring that up because a lot of people don't realize that it is highly innervated, highly vascularized skin. It's, it's like pretty much any other skin on your body. It's not just a soft skin that is useless or whatever. And this was proven with uh, a couple studies, both osteo and, um, and sorrels. And then it protects the glands. And even the AAP back in the 70s said, uh, they pretty much had one sentence, it's there to protect the glands. <laughs> I yeah. don't know why they took away that fact it's still a fact, it still does protect the glands. It keeps it moist, it keeps it lubricated, it keeps it smooth. Um, and 
can even you know protect it from from harm. It's better to harm um, the skin of the crop use instead of harming the, the glands. Perhaps keeping people ignorant to the importance of the foreskin, they uh, kind of push along that need to do it to to do circumcisions. You know, if people don't understand why it's there, they're like, oh, well, it's useless. We'll just cut it off. Yeah. And the AAP, people don't realize, isn't a government operated organization. They're not there so much for the consumer. They're there by, um, they're paid for by the industry. So yeah. they don't necessarily have your interest at, um, at heart. Uh, the rolling mechanism. So it's, you know, is it is it a fold of tissue? It's not just a flap of skin just hanging there. It's it unrolls down onto the shaft of the penis during an erection. People will use the term turtleneck and they say it, they say it in a in a derogatory way. And it's like, can you imagine cutting off the skin of a, <laughs> of a poor turtle's neck? I mean, he won't be able to put his head out there anymore. And the penis works the same way. It, you know, it extends and retracts. So <laughs> I don't know why people. <laughs> it's obvious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then the moisture and lubrication aspect to it, because it is covered, and there's, uh, you know, there's, it, it, it's lubricated. It's, there's, there's fluid in there um, underneath, and it. It's pretty obvious on an intact man when you retract it's all shiny and everything. It's like, well, that's good. It's wet. Uh, then there's a the frenulum. And that's the part, kind of like the part that's underneath your tongue, right? That uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's the little piece of skin that kind of anchors your tongue down to your, the bottom of your mouth. Um, there's a, the frenulum that anchors the the foreskin, the prep use, to the glands. So when the penis starts relaxing back, it pulls the the prep use back up onto the clamp. And that's snipped um, to varying degrees. And supposedly really, really sensitive. I, I, I've been making this connection lately that you know, when you look at genitalia, um, you know, what females actually have the same parts. They're just mm -hmm. size different and you know, it's just a matter of you know, being smaller versus larger. And, you know, the, you have the glands clitoris, just like the males have the glands penis. And when I, I always hear that, you know, females, they get, um, they get set aside, block clapping just by flicking, right, the, the, the clitoris, right? Well, that happens to be the same area as the frenulum on, on, on a penis and proven to be very, very sensitive. And Guy, the, the Glenn, Glenn Callender, he showed up on the American Circumcision documentary and yes. he ran, uh, runs uh, CANFAP, Canadian Foreskin yeah. Awareness Project. And he talks about how, you know, just fucking the, the, that part can satisfy a man. Yes, I personally uh, don't have the physical experience of that, but I do have experience in stimulating that area. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Females have foreskins too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ridged band uh, is definitely something that gets cut off. This is the section where it's kind of like your lips, where it goes from the mucosal part to the external part. So it's typically right at the, when the penis is relaxed, it's right at the end of the, of the prep use. I uh, understand that's really highly innervated and that just the, the stretching of that, you know, causes sensations. Uh, and that's obviously ablated no matter how, you know, almost, I, actually, I think that's back, there's actually one person I spoke with recently where he was kind of sort of botched where only a little bit of his prep use was removed. So part of his rich band was still there. That's extremely rare to hit right here. But, uh, he's pissed off that you know any of it was cut off, obviously. But yeah. yeah. In terms uh, of vision, that's kind of where you hope to be. Yeah, 
Yeah. As much left as possible. <laughs> Excuse me, just a second. Okay, um, so some of the effects that men end up with when they have their preppies removed is, for instance, scrotal webbing, um, which often relates to a hairy shaft during erections. Um, because when you don't have the preppies to unroll down onto the penis, instead, you're having to pull up on other parts like the scrotum and the pelvic floor. Uh, so, do you want to tell us a little bit about anything about your partners and did they experience any of that kind of thing? Um, I didn't really notice with past partners, but my current um, husband, I've noticed um, a few of those issues. Yeah. Um, I don't know that he would want me to talk about them though. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, for me, when I was figuring this out, it was quite um, traumatic to learn about the villain. Uh, That's yeah, why I have this. <laughs> bit of uh, turbulence in our marriage just because of how, uh, how much I was researching about it and I was posting about it on Facebook all the time and talking about it all the time. And he kind of asked me in the beginning for like, time to process it and I didn't really understand that he yeah. needed time to process it so and I was kind of just throwing all the stuff at him and he was just yeah yeah you know this is this jumping a little bit ahead you know into the relationships um thing you know, co-parenting and um and family and stuff like that um i pretty sure Jennifer saw her walk in and out earlier um is okay with me talking about this um, but it, it creates stress in, in relationships um, for many reasons, not just, you know, having sex itself, but talking about it. Um, she didn't, uh, when she first started talking about this and she got into activism more sooner than I did. And I didn't until after I kind of dealt with all the grief and, and got into it and all. And it's kind of funny, she's become more of the, um, the burnt out intactivist, which is kind of where these interviews have kind of led to, and I've become more of the active intactivist. And uh, and when she would talk about it, it would cause me stress when she was first getting into it and you know learning about it and, and dealing with the trauma of how I'm affected, you know, made things difficult for me. And I had to, you know, put barriers up like, okay, enough too much <laughs> information. Now it's the other way around. Whenever I want to talk about intactivism and, and, and doing things about it, she's so burnt out. She doesn't, she just can't she can handle it. So yeah, I can imagine. Uh, testes, um, for me, when uh, when I was younger, my testes, obviously, my, my scrotum has stretched out since I've gotten older. I'm 50 now, but, um, but when I was younger, when I get an erection, sometimes or quite often actually, my testes would get pulled up um, and get squeezed a little bit by the by the scrotum, and even I like have one go into my body, and it's like I'd have to stop uh, being doing sexual activity, whether it's masturbating or having sex or whatever, and relax my my erection because it just got too big and did too much. Uh, made things really uncomfortable with the testes. So that's like uh, getting kicked in the balls, but not quite as hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then the pelvic floor. Uh, so when I'm when I get erect, the penis curves up towards my my not my stomach because the skin is so tight. It starts doing that instead of just going out. And anyone can look up a. a a di a, an image that shows the anatomy and you can see how the, the corpus cavernosum of the penis goes from the anus straight out and it's supposed to so your penis is supposed to go straight out from your body not out and then up and mm -hmm. this 
causes challenges when um, when the partner wants to straighten out the penis. Because now, not only are you causing a bit of a kink one way, but you're also creating a kink the other way. Yeah. So it's like a double kink. Uh, and the corpus cavernosum is not designed for, you know, extreme bending. It's kind of like taking a balloon, filling it up, and then when you twist it and, and then, you know, twist it, it, it kinks, right? Yeah. So. Uh, Mialocinosis. Something I um, experienced is that anything that you come across yourself with? Um, no, I just uh, you know just read about it. Okay, so you're aware of what it is. Yeah. Uh, skin bridges. Any experiences with that? No. Okay. Uh, erectile dysfunction. Um, no, not that one either. No, at least not yet, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're still in our young mid uh, yeah, 30s, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I really hate educating fellow previous amputees about this because I, I worry that what happened to me um, going through the trauma and everything will happen to them and that, that will affect them in uh, many ways because, you know, your brain is your biggest sexual yeah. organ and when you start realizing how you're harmed that's gonna affect you when you're being sexual so yeah yeah uh, that is something that my husband thought i uh he was very aware of so he became aware of it and he thought that that's all i saw also which isn't the case but that was what he thought about yeah Okay. Um, if he's ever interested in doing an interview with me, I'd love to interview him. Okay. Um, general botches, uh, like uh, curved penises or um, crushed or partially removed glands or anything like that. Did you come across any of that? Um, no, but my, I remember babysitting for um, a cousin and um, I, I still wasn't aware of exactly what circumcision was. So they had a pretty um, loose circumcision like you were uh, talking about a few moments ago for only uh, the, the first bit of it was removed. And um, so there was, uh, I don't want to say extra because it's supposed to be there, yeah. but it, it looked like uh, extra skin. Mm -hmm. And you look at it and you're like, well, um, if, if it is a circumcision, well, then why is all of this left here? Um, yeah. so, again, I wouldn't say that's a botched, <laughs> mm -hmm. so oh. in terms okay. of circumcision, you want more to yeah. accommodate for growth later, but. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Partnerships. I'm assuming that you're just heterosexual. Yes. Okay. Um, so, do you feel like uh, it impacts sex for you when your partner is missing part of his genitalia? Um, um, there is some pain that I wasn't aware of before. I just thought it was, you know, normal. Um, but since I've learned uh, what circumcision removes. Uh, I do notice like um, the corona will act as like a, a lip and it will catch onto my pubic bone and that causes a good deal of pain. Oh. So we have to move around a bit to, mm -hmm. to kind of alleviate that issue. Um, yeah, yeah so like with an intact penis, that uh, corona is sliding in and out of its own or inside of the um, right. Prepuce and your pelvic bone is probably sitting, you know, at, at the most right there, if not further down. So as as it's, you know, the retractions are going, you know, coming out, it's definitely not going to be a lot smoother. Yeah, I can understand that. Forcing would kind of bunch behind that, so it wouldn't be as big of a lip there to catch. Yeah. 
you know. Interesting. Uh, a lot of people talk about how, you know, it kind of acts like a scoop or it scoops the, the fluids out of the vagina and you yeah. put those in there during intercourse. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, any other thoughts on how it affects, affects sex? Um, not that I have personal experience with. Okay. All right, so the next section is uh, psychological impacts. And uh, it's, you probably, I don't imagine this is a, uh, something that affects you because you aren't cut yourself, but the first thing is the trauma from the cut. Um, people are like, mm -hmm. well, the baby doesn't remember or whatever. <laughs> yes, um, but, but the brain stores that trauma somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And there's there's definitely cases where men have said that they uh, you know had, um, including myself, had <laughs> dreams or nightmares, um, and they attributed it to their genome mutilation. This guy here, Jay Jackson, he actually actually happens to live here in the LA area. Um, he talks about his. Um, his nightmares that he had well into his adulthood um and he and he explains how he you know did some thinking about it to figure out yes it had to have something to do with when he was getting cut Uh, then traumas from the discoveries of the loss, harm. Um, you're not a general mutilation survivor yourself, but do you have any experiences or talk to anyone uh, about the trauma when they figured out how they were hurt? Um, first, there's like a... Um denial that they put up the, they get really defensive and then um, yeah so then afterwards when they kind of accept what was done um then they look at themselves and like i said uh, my husband kind of all he could think about when he looked at himself there for a while was you know what happened to him you know what could be missing what um, how would it have functioned differently had he not been? Yeah. You know, There's a whole uh, cycle of trauma that he had to go through. Mm -hmm. And I imagine yeah. everyone when they kind of learn about that. Yeah, and not many men are wanting to talk about it. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then there, you know, there's men like me that are introverted, and I didn't talk about it, but <laughs> here I am now, <laughs> 15 years later. But <laughs> yeah, I can imagine it takes a bit of time to process that. <laughs> yeah, it took me a lot of years. Um, when I look back on it, it's like, yeah, I went through that uh, those stages of grief over and over and over again. I didn't just do it once. I didn't yeah. learn about all these, you know, physical harms once. It's like I learned about like the moisture and lube. Um, aspects like what that would be nice to have that you know and then you know then i kind of retract and being introverted i processed it internally you know talk to anyone about it and then you know, i learned something else and it's like the warning mechanism so that yeah. actually does this well that that would be different and you know and man this is pissing me off <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've um, kind of learned to like tiptoe around my husband when um, finding out new uh, problems that it causes. And I'm like, well, I don't want to cause him any more grief. <laughs> so like, uh, I'll try and share stuff on Facebook. So like, I don't have to present that information directly. <laughs> like, he can read about it if he wants to. Yeah. Or not. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's a struggle for me to um, educate fellow men about this because I, I hate to see them go through the trauma and all, but at the same time, I hate more that it, the trauma is continuing to occur. That is, the, the cutting 
tens of thousands of children every single day get their genitals cut without medical need. And that bugs me. Um, it, it, that, that fight within myself, that the, the child wins out over yeah. and over again. So, um, and unfortunately we're gonna have to have, it seems like we're gonna have, to have more men speak out and complain um, before this is stopped. Um, you look at the female side of genital mutilation and there's, you know, I probably count on, you know, single digits of how many women complain about, um, you know, the fact that they were generally cut. It's, it's very similar to the U.S. It's like most women in general cutting cultures defend their practice. Mm -hmm. um, just like men in the U.S. you know, want to defend the, you know, the practice in the U.S. So, um, but yeah, it, it's only taken, you know, a small number of women to write books or whatever. Um, Hebo World Deer, for example, um, and uh, and that's enough for people to say, okay, well, we need to create laws against it. But uh, the hundreds of thousands of men that speak out um, haven't been enough to put an end to male you know, cutting. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, an illustration that comes to mind, and it's a man kind of huddled over and he's just hiding or holding a sign that reads, uh, I did not consent. And then there was like women walking past mm -hmm. them and like yeah. just uh, making fun of them and yeah. scrutinizing them and like, well, this is why they yeah. don't count. <laughs> yeah, be a man, don't complain, you know, yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, I'm very familiar with that. Uh, <laughs> I've seen that uh, meme roll around many times. That's sad. Uh, another thing in the psychological section is about suicide. And I'm as, assuming you've heard of some of the suicides that happened, like David Reamer and Jonathan Conte and Alex Hardy. Um, mm -hmm. Any other, have you come across any other cases? Um, I've not uh, seen anyone. I don't know of anyone personally. And those are kind of like the only names that I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at some of my um, interviews, uh, one, one I did last night and I haven't uploaded it yet, but um, in two of my interviews in the past couple of weeks, uh, I've come across men that have committed suicide and, um, and they are men that know or that knew that they were harmed by the procedure. Uh, whether they were, whether they committed suicide, particularly because of it or not is, you know, another question, but uh, it's definitely sounds like it was a major factor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, I really worry that we're going to have more men uh, commit suicide over this. So, and, uh, yeah. and it won't, it won't get this mainstream media attention that it probably needs to in order to help put an end to this. Yeah, and that's another reason that I'm kind of hesitant explaining to men like, hey, this is, this is what circumcision is and what it took from you. No, I don't want to cause that, <laughs> that pain. Uh, the psychological impacts to children, and of course, I, not when I bring that up, I'm not just talking about children that are recognizing that they were harmed physically. Um, you also have, in some cultures, boys are cut, you know, at older ages, eight years old to 11, 12. So you can even go to the Zosa tribe in Africa and they, they get cut to become men, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. Um, so I'm sure that you know, that, that definitely has a psychological impact on them. But at the same time, they're in cultures where it's deemed necessary to become men or, or whatever. Um, but there's also the effect on children that are not generally cut. Um, I often worry about my own sons because they, they see me doing this um, intactivism. They, they come across the, the statements of people that are trying to protect the practice and all that. And, uh, and they're you know, horrified and disgusted. Um, and they sometimes find me on protests and stuff like that. And I've seen lots of other intactivists take their children out to hold signs or whatever. And while I think that's great that they learn, you know, that they have a voice and you know, they can um, you know, speak up for human rights and all that, I, 
hate to see that they have to live in this world where we're still barbaric on a certain level. Do you, uh, do you have any kids or any experiences? Um, I have three children. Um, my oldest is, uh, my two oldest are girls, nine and three and a half. And then my son is uh, just uh, a year and a half. So okay. I don't have any experience with him learning about that. Yeah. Uh, but my goal, my hopes is to uh, just try and educate him about his body and what it and what it's uh, and the benefits of him having his whole body. So that when, um, if someone does make fun of him or tries to say something, uh, then he can be like, well, I can do this. Can you, you know, like, you know, this is, this is a good thing. This is, I'm happy to have this part of my body. Yeah, great. Yeah. I'm hoping that will kind of offset any uh, any bullying or yeah. The interview I did just before this was uh, you know earlier I was with the German man and he he actually got, and talked about him and his one of his buddies actually made fun of a boy that was cut. So it can go either way. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it, yeah, there's a possibility. I, I'm assuming that you'll probably raise your, your child so he doesn't do something like this. But is it a possibility that your son would I don't know bully or make fun of or whatever a cut boy? Uh, you know, things have been shifting quite a bit in the U.S., and um, there's a very good chance that he he might be part of the majority. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping that he won't bully anyone else for that. <laughs> like all bodies are different, and it's not their fault. <laughs> yeah, my my sons, I think they they feel pity, um, you know, sadness for boys that are missing that part. They, I don't, it doesn't seem like, I haven't raised them. I don't think they're the kinds that would make fun of or bully anyone. So yeah, I, my attitude is, you know, raise your children to, you know, be proud of what they have. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so the next section is medical professionals. Are you in the medical profession in any way? Um, I am not, I'm not studying to be a, a midwife, but I'm only like in the prerequisite, so I haven't even got to the medical part yet. <laughs> okay. Do, uh, will they be teaching about the topic? Um, on my end? Yeah, well, when, as you're going through schooling, to um, have you even gotten to like a textbook where you open the textbook and there's a section where they talk about the anatomy of the penis? Um, not quite yet. I'm in biology right now, and um, the uh, I actually um, have this book. I have this book, and one of the first things I noticed, like it's first page, uh, the anatomy of the male. He's an, an intact man. I was like, I took a picture and sent it. I think the your whole baby uh, directors I was like, hey, look at this. This is so cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Good. Oh yeah, I, I'll have to try to see if I can find that because I'm definitely curious. I, I think that's one of our main areas of attack that we should be working on is to get the textbooks corrected. Um, yes, yeah, um, yeah. And you know, not just for the male uh, anatomy, but for the female anatomy too. There's this, um, this activist, her name is Jessica Penn. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I follow her. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Her, she and I get into it a lot. Um, she doesn't think that male circumcision harms much, but if at all, but uh, you know, she's right though that the the book should include um, innervation of the clitoris. Uh, mm -hmm. They need to improve the, the textbooks around it, and that you know OBGYNs should not be going into the field until they've been taught that. Uh, in surgery, that you know cut that area should not be cutting that area until they learn where the nerves are. <laughs> So they don't accidentally cut the nerves and uh and yeah. the same thing with the male um you know anatomy with textbooks is you know a lot of textbooks leave out a whole lot of important information yeah yeah i think that um my thought is that we won't get rid of it until we get the medical side on board yeah. uh, because until doctors refuse to participate 
and perform these surgeries, then you know they'll they'll always be around. Yeah, yeah. At the very very least, they should stop pushing the darn thing. You know, it, yeah. According to Intact America, ninety four percent of hospitals still push it as a you know an important thing to do. They're like, you know, much like they push vaccines. So it's fortunately I experienced that. Um, I was. Um, they asked uh, when he when he was first born. I think they asked, and then twice more, but just during shift change. And it was more like, "Is this happening? Yes or no?" And then they like left it alone. There wasn't any like trying to convince me or asking my reasons. They just yes, yeah. no, no big deal. Okay. Um. So. Okay, so that's psychological. Do you, have you ever been in a situation where you were witness to, to the procedure? Um, when I was in the hospital, um, after I had my son, like, um, there were cries. I can't say for certain that that's what it was, but in my head that, that that's what was happening. Yeah. I just, you know, holding yeah. it tight, you know, a little extra onto my baby. Yeah. Like, I'm not doing that to you. That's not happening here. Yeah, just the fact that this happens, and we know that it happens in hospitals, so it's, it makes sense that that would be one of the first, your first thoughts when you hear a baby, you know, crying or yeah. screaming. Because it, it was, it was a different cry. Like, yeah, there's um, the, I want held, I'm hungry, I need yeah. attention, and the, I'm in pain. Yeah. It's, it's pretty easy to tell, I, I think. You can definitely hear a difference in the screen. Yeah, uh, <laughs> just even thinking about it. Yeah. Just, oh. <laughs> yeah, that one, that one haunts me. <laughs> That's yeah, so, a sound you won't soon forget. Yeah, and so I, I wonder about medical professionals that are around that on a daily basis. I, I personally could not work at a facility that that performed that. I just couldn't imagine that. And I, I've, you know, as much as I'm in IT myself, I've, um, I've been, I've considered positions at hospitals that, you know, needed IT guys. Yeah, that's um, actually, um, I have uh, changed uh, paths because I was going to go through nursing school um, to be a certified nurse midwife, mm -hmm. but um, issues with vaccinations uh, and then they require you to participate or at the very least observe a circumcision. And I just, that's not something I'm, that's not a question. Like, <laughs> that's, yeah. That was actually something we, uh, a bunch of us in activists brought up um, in Portland, Oregon with a school there. And um, we were like, you guys don't require this for people to pass. And they're like, no, you, you don't have to. In order to, pat, to, to get your degree. Yeah, so, and then as um, as a nurse, because I would have to work, um, then uh, so they would. Uh, you have the option to be a conscientious objector, mm -hmm. but that doesn't um, uh, that doesn't guarantee that your job will be there. Yeah. Like I could be like I refuse, but they're like, okay, well you won't do this, so there's not a position for you available and then so that kind of yeah. shifted my uh, path a bit I was like all right well I guess I won't go into the medical side of that yeah. <laughs> so just yeah. kind of we'll get there a different way <laughs> yeah, one of the well-known stories is there on Milo how she got fired because she told people the facts you know when they were yeah. considering doing it and that then those facts would upset people mm -hmm. for whatever reason and, yeah. yeah so yeah I, I see you know this psychologically affecting medical professionals in lots of ways uh, yeah. I imagine I'm sure that a lot of people just learn to tune it out or they numb themselves to the procedure or whatever yeah yeah even um when I was pregnant I went for uh, registration um, before I was in labor and they did like a little class of uh, what to expect um, and then they had a little info 
or a little paper with information about circumcision. And I, oh my, I was like 38 weeks pregnant and I just burst into tears. And um, I was telling the whole class that all of this information is wrong and outdated. And like just went through each one and everybody looked at me like I was crazy. But I, cause I was just pouring tears. Yeah. And was, this is all wrong. <laughs> it was, oh wow. man. Well, good for you for I couldn't I couldn't yeah. hold my tongue. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. I, you know, <laughs> you know how they talk about uh, you know, bite your tongue. Oh it, yeah, no. Yeah, that's some real truth to that because I've realized that when I'm holding back what I want to say or holding back my truth, or whatever, I do accidentally bite my tongue, especially when I'm eating. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm like, um, I was filling out some of the paperwork and that was one question on the paperwork. Uh, and then I can hear like the other parents talking about it before we actually like went over the paper. And the one nurse was sitting with me because she could see my face was red and I was like, I started crying a little bit. She's like, what's wrong? And I was like, all of these moms are going to cut their babies. <laughs> and oh man, oh, wow. I think out of the eight couples, um, seven of us were having boys. Uh, and wow. the one was even having twin boys. And I like wrote down the Your Whole Baby website. I was like, please just go and visit the site. <laughs> but yeah, they all looked at me like I was crazy. Oh, man. I hope that changes soon. Uh, all right, so that was medical professionals. Unless you have any other thoughts on that, that psychological effect from medical professionals. <laughs> No, okay. Uh, the parent, uh, how parents are affected psychologically from from this, and it doesn't have to be you know just parents that are regret parents or, um, I mean, it, even parents uh, like me that um, were we managed to keep our sons intact, but it was the eleventh hour that uh, that my wife and I got information and learned about it and decided to protect, you know, keep our sons intact. Um, but it psychologically affects me sometimes when I think about that, that, you know, right now my son could be harmed. What are your thoughts uh, on that? Yeah, I was very fortunate to even just happen upon um, someone that thinks vision in the in the group because like, I had two girls um, and when I was pregnant with my second girl um, I asked my husband about it uh, before we knew it was girl and he was like well um, you know we're going to do that and I was just like okay and then just didn't really think about it um, and then once once I knew I was having a boy the next time um, I even still at the beginning was like, you know, okay, this, this is what's going to have to happen. Mm. Uh, so I was, I was so grateful uh, to have found the website, even, even that one person uh, inviting me to the community group. Um, yeah. So you two are, you're, you're thankful for an activist. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> me too. So Thankful that uh, someone gave us some information. Yeah. And uh, luckily, I you know I didn't resist the information. Um, my wife definitely didn't resist the information, um, but a lot of people do, and uh, and it makes it difficult for us general autonomy advocates to do so because we're worried about um, people having a negative reaction to us. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's why I was glad it was the Your Whole Baby because I don't know um, if I would have been receptive to that information had it been more harsh mm -hmm. and um, attacking yeah. like I some contactivists. <laughs> uh, I know. I know uh, Your Whole Baby has a gentle education um, yeah. mantra, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked with your old baby as much as I can, um, even though I'm, because I am a, a victim, it's hard for me to stay gentle, um, especially when I'm dealing with um, someone with, you know, I, 
would consider willful ignorance. I, at that point, I might start shaming them or whatever. Um, yeah. So that's challenging sometimes. But uh, you know, my attitude is, you know, people need to hear not just the education, but they need to see that there are men like me that are upset, extremely so, about the fact that this was done to them. And, um, and if they don't see that, then they're not going to believe, they might not even necessarily believe the information that's put into them gently. So you take the combination of the two and it's like, okay, well, maybe you should rethink this before you know, doing this to your own son because he might end up being one of these men that complain. Yeah, yeah I, um, I forward people to uh, Bloodstained Men a lot and Brother K. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just because yeah. a lot of people are like, you're a woman, you don't know. And I'm like, okay, well, here are these guys who yeah. do know. <laughs> so yeah. take, no. <laughs> I often refer people to men do complain that. Um, yeah, that is the, that is another one. Yeah, yeah. just because it's, it's something that's pretty easy to remember. But I think men, I, that's very easy to remember too. But um, you know, your uh, um, men do complain actually have you know testimonials, and your whole baby also has a section on um, from men yeah. giving testimonials. So yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so we just went over parent. Um, the psychological impact to intact men. Do you have any perspectives on that? Um, I don't personally. Well, I guess I do. Um, when I was uh, researching, um, when I was pregnant, um, one of my husband's friends is an intact man. Um, and my husband has told me stories when they were younger that uh, he hated it and he wished his parents had circumcised him when he was younger. Yeah. Um, so I was like, okay, this is, I need to talk to him about this before. Um, so I reached out to him and he was like, actually, you know, he, when he was a teenager, um, he grew up in Maryland. So it was a pretty high cut area. Yeah. Um, so he heard uh, all the jokes and all the stigmas. So oh, he, he wasn't happy with himself, yeah. uh, but he he really he was happy with himself at that point. He was like, "I'm glad uh, I I have my whole body." Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, um, his girlfriend um, convinced him to circumcise their son, and I was like, "I don't understand that <laughs> at all." Yeah. I and then so. Um, and then I'm like, you know, you're an intact man. And she's basically telling you that that's not okay. That, yeah, she was with him. I, right. I don't get that logic. How yeah. Did you jump from, yeah. I just don't get that. And yeah. it, it's I not mean, the first time I've heard that happen either. I actually met one guy yeah. in person. Um, he, his wife was from Israel. So mm. obviously very common, but he's intact. So, yeah. but he allowed it to happen to his own sons. So it didn't make mm. a lot of sense to me. Make any sense to me. <laughs> but yeah, but there, you know, there's, there's, you know, proof right there. There, you know, men are that are growing up in um, cultures that where the rate of cutting is high, then they're kind of like indoctrinated in this culture to believe that they're dirty down there, that they shouldn't have that, yeah. or whatever. But uh, some men are convinced, you know, to cut themselves, and some are very regretful that they've done it. And then there's men that manage to stay intact and figure it out, like this guy did. So, interesting. Yeah, in in my um, and within my activism, I've most of the intact men are very thankful. Um, Good. Yeah. Good. Very yeah. few. Very few are not happy with it, but then they don't um, understand what they have. Yeah. So I'm like, hey, uh, there's a, um, a video on YouTube. It's like a 15 minute video that covers all the functions of foreskin. Mm -hmm. I usually send that to them and they're like, oh, wow, I didn't realize yeah. this is what I have. And I was like, well. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I talked to a guy in person, I was like, 
you really want your glands to be dry and you don't want to get rid of that mobile mobile skin and all that it's like then they shut up they don't <laughs> they, they're like stunned and they don't even know how to respond and then i was i was having a conversation with my husband actually um and it was about um the clitoris and somehow i'm not sure how the conversation got started uh, but he was like can you imagine if they would cut the clitoral hood away and then uh now you have all that stimulation and you're rubbing against your clothes all the time and then you you would probably dry out right and i'm just like yeah <laughs> are we making connections <laughs> yeah but some people say you can't compare FGM and MGM, or you can't compare FGM to male circumcision. It's like, oh boy, yeah. <laughs> Still cutting of genitalia. Yeah. Okay, uh, then the next major section is about relationships and how relationships are harmed. And the first part I cover is child parent trust. So um, you're not a, a victim yourself of either male or female circumcision. So I don't imagine you having any kind of trust issues with your own parents uh, about the topic. Um, not my own parents. Oh. I don't have trust issues with, but like my um, in-laws, mm. I kind of, um, cause when we were researching it, my, my in-laws were like, well, that was my decision to make and i'm glad i made it and you seem to be benefiting just fine from that and i was like what <laughs> in the world wait a second <laughs> yeah let me show you what i'm not benefiting from <laughs> but that, that's actually um, interesting that's, that's the first time that anyone brought up um in-laws i didn't even consider that um aspect of child parent um we didn't really have a strained relationship before that but that moment kind of turned my yeah away from that and kind of put a strain on it after that i started looking at him a little differently and i don't know it's just not the same anymore yeah i hear you well that's that's a very interesting aspect to this thank you for sharing that it's great okay uh co-parenting um you're a parent of three child three children now three yeah um was the, was your relationship with your husband um, strained at all when you guys started, when you had children and the discussion came up? Um, yeah, it was because, um, like I said, I spent a good six to eight hours a day there for the first several weeks. Um, so there wasn't a lot of attention I was giving to him. Um, and then uh, I was always posting about it on Facebook. So he, he ended up asking me to like slow down, let him take a minute to process. Like I said earlier, I didn't really understand yeah. that he, he really needed that time. Yeah. Um, so when I just kept going, he withdrew. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I can understand that. <laughs> it, uh, even after my son was born, um, he said it kind of, uh, put a strain on his relationship with the baby uh, because and he was kind of resentful a little bit because he felt like it wasn't um <laughs> decision that he was able to have a say in i kind of he didn't know if it was his own thoughts or my thoughts forced mm -hmm. onto him so that it took uh wow. so that i started my research um right at the beginning of my pregnancy. And then even like three or four months after my son was born, it, it took a while yeah. to kind of get back into, uh, back to talking to each other about stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have this on the list, but it kind of makes me think maybe I should have it on the list because it seems like fathers, uh, cut fathers with intact sons um, kind of distance themselves from their sons because of this. Um, so, yeah. He did it first. Yeah. It was yeah. kind of, um, yeah. And I don't know that it was because um, my son is intact and he isn't. I think it was more of 
the way I approached uh, making that decision. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take all the weight on that one, honestly. I, mean, <laughs> I, I think that there's, yeah. Uh, I, I love my sons dearly, but I can, I think I can see how some men would feel different towards their own sons simply because of the fact that their sons have something that they never got the opportunity to have. And yeah. that doesn't have, I would not lay any of the blame for that on my own wife. For, for you know, enlightening me about the fact of missing something. Yeah. Yeah, looking back, I would have, um, I would have approached that differently. Yeah. Like I would have given him the space he needed. I would have presented the information and allowed him to go through it as yeah. he needed. Um, and then we could have come together and made that decision, non-decision really. Um, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we could have we could have did that together instead of me kind of just badgering him about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's I'm that's a whole challenging yeah. to talk about. <laughs> okay, uh, the next thing is mother child bond, and this particularly gets into uh, especially like shortly after birth. Uh, there's lots of beliefs that. Um, a child should be with the mother, even like skin to skin contact um, for a good period of time after birth. And taking the baby away to cut off part of its genitalia definitely breaks that bond. Yeah. And yeah, this is something I try to talk. I don't have obviously uh, experience with that myself, but I try and talk to especially um, expecting mothers about that. Mm -hmm. If I tell them like this isn't something that happens to everyone, because um, I know it affects breastfeeding relationships also. Yeah. So I'm like, um, in some way or another, it will affect your bond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard the breastfeeding side of it plenty of times. Like, if the child is in trauma and in pain down there, um, and you can't, you can't really give it pain medication without knocking the baby out or you know or even safely at all um so it's in pain and trying to you know breastfeed at the same time it, that's really a challenging thing yeah so i mean, I mean that's that's to empathize a little bit with the baby and just kind of put yourself there <sighs> yeah because the first 24 hours they like to sleep a lot anyways yeah. um so there's not a whole lot of breastfeeding. Uh, then that second day is when they start to pick up and it seems like they're always feeding. So if you interrupt that with the circumcision, then it's gonna have an effect. You know, uh, that second day and the following days. Uh, pedophilia. <clears throat> So there's some thoughts around how this contributes to pedophilia. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, I have seen this discussed, um, and it, uh, I've seen it discussed around um, some doctors using the, uh, that interest to um, kind of fuel their desire to circumcised babies. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that is the case for some, but I don't know that it would be even a majority. I'm not, I'm not yeah. sure. I'd really like to see a study done um, that compares pedophiles that are previously amputated or circumcised compared to ones that are not. Um, yeah, that would be interesting. Because I, I know there is um, a correlation between abuse victims mm -hmm. um, who go on to abuse. I so I, that personally. Yeah, so. Yeah. yeah um, one of my um, theories around it is, you know, men are missing, you know, good half or more of their sensitive skin on their penis. So they have to resort to other stimulation to be satisfied. And one of those stimulations is 
um, tightness around the penis. Um, and that's why some men are attracted to tight sex and, uh, and some women, you know, they do their Kegels or whatever to help create that tightness. So, um, yeah. so that's my theory is that that's another reason why um, men might be attracted to younger women because supposedly they have their tiger down there. Interesting theory. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll, you know, it makes it's just, sense. It's just a theory. You know? uh, it, makes, you know, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, do what do what you want with it, but yeah. All right, uh, the doctor-patient relationship. I think we already talked a little bit about this, but uh, you know, the for me, the I couldn't ever have a doctor, um, or I couldn't have a doctor that treated me that would um, promote or do something like this to children at all. Um, yeah, that is, I wouldn't want to be uh, associated with that type of doctor either. Um, thankfully, it wasn't brought up before my son was born. Um, like none of my OBs talked about it. Um, but I did interview um, the pediatricians and the uh, nurse practitioners at, at my children's pediatrician office and I, I would ask them like how to care for it like what their opinions on circumcision were and the ones that were kind of pro I was like nope I don't yeah. want to I don't want to even see you at all I hope lots of doctors see this video and uh, these videos because uh, you're not the first one that says stuff like that and maybe doctors will rethink <laughs> promoting this because if they want patients they <laughs> might want yeah. to you're clear. So. And even um, my son's doctor, once once I found one that I liked, um, he went to examine him and knowing that he doesn't need to touch the penis for any reason whatsoever, um, as soon as he went to grab him, I was like, no, don't stop. And he's like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not going to do anything. And I was like, no, you are. He's like, well, I just want to pull it back enough to see the opening. I was like, well, nope, that's not necessary. necessary. He can pee just fine. Yeah, you gonna look inside of a little girl's vagina? Right. I'm like, <laughs> so he can pee just fine if there, even if there was any, um, yeah. I don't want to say not normal, but if there was any variation, yeah. uh, surgery wouldn't be an option anyway. So we don't. Um, so I actually sent him a packet from your whole baby about the forced injury, oh. sent oh, it baby. and, um, uh, I actually wrote the cover letter cause I wanted to him to know who sent the letter, whose parent it was, why I was sending it. Awesome. And he actually called me when he received it. Um, oh. and he was, he, he thanked me for sending it. Um, and he informed me that he um, uh, distributed it to the rest of the practice. So awesome. I think the practice, I think the practice has about uh, eight or nine doctors, uh -huh. and then a few nurse practitioners. Um, so yeah, he he gave it to all of them. Uh, yeah. So I was I was I really <laughs> yeah. The office was already on the uh, intact friendly provider list. Uh, from yeah. your baby, so this kind of just tipped them, <laughs> tipped them all over the edge there. Awesome, so, nice. That's great, Robin. That's really awesome. So, anyone that's reading or watching this, please consider that there is um, your whole baby provides lots of tools to be an activist and make it really easy for you to do so. Yes. Yeah. Okay, anything else on the doctor-patient relationship? Um, even though they are all aware of proper intact care now, um, I still um, start exams by letting them know, like, hey, my son is intact. You do not have permission to touch his penis for any reason whatsoever. Um, and they usually look at me like, uh, I wasn't planning on it, but okay. Oh, well, good. <laughs> 
I also carry, um, I think I gave it away to someone else, but there, your whole baby has a laminated um, card with a QR code on it for mm -hmm. proper intact care that I usually carry it. I need, I need to order a new one yeah. uh, so that doctors can scan that and get information um, just in case anyone tries to argue with me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it would, I, I see stories about forced retraction in uh, emergency uh, care a lot or in um, urgent care. So I think that would be helpful in those times. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I'm sure that uh, some of the people that volunteer and in in run the Your Whole Baby organization is gonna appreciate this video. <laughs> I mean, I am I'm actually a volunteer for them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I've done a lot of tabling myself. And all that. Okay, uh, friends and family relationships. You were talking a little bit about your um, relationship with your in-laws about this after um, learning more about it and bringing up and talking about it. Um, any other friends and family relationship uh, hurdles, challenges? I have actually had a lot of friends and family members um, disassociate with me because of my activism. Um, like family members have blocked me on Facebook. They don't talk to me at family events. They just don't want anything to do with me, even though like this one particular family member um, has a girl and she you know, doesn't plan on having any other children. So I'm like, what is the big deal? Um, um, other family members are thankful. Um, I have, uh, the one family member has two boys that she's already is, uh, she's actually become a regret mom now. She's like, had I known, I never would yeah. have done this. Yeah. Um, and then other, you know, other family members are thankful. Um, but yeah, uh, they haven't really talked to me about it since, the beginning they don't i don't i don't think they want to um kind of question that <laughs> yeah i i sympathize i this is a very common challenge and that's why i have it on the list is that uh there's general cutting these general cutting practices across the world to affect uh, relationships with friends and family um, especially as people learn the facts and try to educate others on it and for some reason it's like a taboo thing and uh and people withdraw um, from the information which it doesn't make a lot of sense i would think that people would want to um, know facts and, and hear the reality and all that but something about the cognitive dissonance turns on in people's heads and yeah they they want to get away from you yes that <laughs> Okay. Anything else on the on the friends and family aspect? And retrieve that real quick. I had something, but it, it disappeared. Um, oh. <laughs> um, Give me a second. Um, I have uh, a lot of family members are uh, in the medical field, and they've. Um, of challenged me because of the education they received was not up to date or accurate. Uh, they try to argue with me and tell me that I don't have a degree, so I'm not as educated. And I'm like, well, your American education. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's a struggle also. Yeah. No, I, I, I personally have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, some, you know, doctors. I, I actually, I was really surprised. One time I called a, a, a urologist's office and he actually, the urologist ended up calling me back and had a long conversation, a good hour plus long conversation. And he jived right into the usual excuses that I'm sure you've heard <laughs> and took care of each and every single one of them without any problem. And uh, yeah, it was like, even you know, I don't. I don't have to prove or disprove the medical benefits, right? 
um, they agree. They, they, they won't fight you on the fact that it is innervated tissue, right? It is there for, for purposes. They, I haven't run into a medical professional that, well, I've seen one, but <laughs> that, that deny that, right? Um, and then you start talking about, well, here's the ethics side of it. Here's the logic side of it. And you start talking about that. And this, this year artist, like, you know what, you make a lot of good points. So it ended up with a very cordial ending. I was really happy about that. So you don't have to have a medical degree to, yeah. you know, be able to work through the, the logic and the ethics behind this. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's one thing I come across also is you're not a doctor. I'm like, okay, well, how long ha do doctors study the foreskin and circumcision? Yeah. I can tell you it's not that long. Yeah. I, on the other hand, have been studying this for close to two years. Yeah, exactly. I think I might know a little more. <laughs> yeah, or, or I often say, well, you know, you can go look at doctorsofforskincircumcision.com um, or org, sorry, org. Or you even look at uh, medical statements from all over the world, from other medical associations. Yeah. None of them promote this. So, you know, what's different about the U.S.? And you, you just dig a little deep and you realize it comes down to money. It does. You know, the U.S. is like the only developed country where we don't provide um, universal health care. And, uh, and it's the fee-for-service setup. Um, and so just doctors getting paid to be doctors, they have to actually do something to make money. And if they're not performing the procedure at all, they're not making as much money. And not just um, the doctors performing it, but um, there's also the um, product testing and um, cosme uh, cosmetic side of it. Mm -hmm. Get paid to sell the foreskins. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the sex lube co companies, they depend on this to continue. And the, um, the drug companies that make you know, erectile dysfunction drugs, they also depend on this continuing. Yes, so I just heard a commercial the other day actually, um, and it said 50% of men in the US will experience erectile dysfunction after the age of 40. And I was like, holy crap, that's a lot. Yeah. That's yeah. And how does that compare it to other parts of the world where they don't do this cutting? Yeah. 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 Supposedly we uh, we saw more Viagra in the U.S. than any <laughs> other area of the world. So, yeah. <sighs> okay. So that was the whole relationships thing. Unless you have any other relationships, um, how relationships are impacted. Um, I did talk to my daughter about this. Wow. Uh, watching American Circumcision and she came in and the baby was crying and she was like, well, wait a minute, what's happening here? So I kind of uh, gave her a age appropriate um, description of what was happening. And she was so upset. Wow. She was like, I can't believe they do this. Um, and she asked me, she's nine like, years old? Uh, she's nine now, but she was six. Um, oh, okay. She was six during this conversation. Um, and she was like, well, wait a minute. You didn't do this to me, did you? And I was like, no, I didn't. And she was like, well, did you do it to my little sister? And I was like, no, I did not. <laughs> so she was like, you know, it was, it was connected to her that there was no difference between, you know, little girls and little boys. She was just she was just crying like don't do that to my little brother you have to promise me and i was like i promised <laughs> <laughs> that's so sweet it was sad but sweet at the same time yeah that's awesome hmm. and that kind of goes back to the um you know psychological effects on children yeah about. yeah and she even uh went and friends <laughs> which thankfully i didn't get any parents calling me angry yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah luckily i haven't had any parents of my kids friends uh come along <laughs> either um, but I, I think over here on the west coast things are a little different you know it's a, it's a yeah. lot lower cutting rate than many parts of the u.s so. yeah of course i've gotten called plenty of names and stuff online 
<laughs> so I'm actually, and uh, it's interesting since your, you know, your daughter brought it up. Um, we, the next section is talking about FGM or female circumcision or cotton. Uh, um, there's um, all the names, and there's multiple types of female circumcision. And the reason why I made sure it was on the list is because um, a lot of us believe that female circumcision is doomed to continue until we also end male genital cutting. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, and there's even a push for the female genital cutting to be legal because they are using male genital cutting as that anchor. Mm -hmm. You know, why is it okay for parents of boys to make that decision based on ethical, religious, and cultural reasons, not even the medical side of it? Yeah. Um, so why does that not apply to, you know, little girls too? So they're using that to, to push that agenda. Yeah. And then um, some people are even pointing out that maybe that it needs to be legalized so that um, people can see the hypocrisy of it, like. Well, uh, for a period, it kind of sort of was. Um, in the end of 2018, there was a judge, um, and okay. a federal judge in Michigan that uh, deemed it, um, the, the federal law as unconstitutional. Um, he, a lot of us, you know, hoped that he would use the um, equal protection you know, laws as the reason, but he used the uh, states' rights laws as the reason why it wasn't uh, legal. Yeah, which was unfortunate. Yeah, and then just recently, I guess, uh, Trump signed a, a new um, federal anti-FBM law. Uh, not, what's interesting is that the judge actually said, you know, it's not necessary to have this law because um, it's, it's bad read, you know? Um, there's already laws that protect children from harm. So why do you need to have a law that's specific to cutting genitalia? And, and as far as I'm concerned, as far as I've, I've developed, delved in, and even doctor, I mean, uh, lawyers at um, arclaw.org uh, say, it's, this isn't legal in the first place. It never was. Um, it just hasn't been really questioned because since, you know, sort of the freedom thinking um, and that it was already happening, you know, before the constitution was implemented all that, that they just assumed that it's legal. They didn't question it when the you know human rights bills were signed into law and all that. Okay, any other thoughts on FGM? Um, yeah, just uh, uh, the conversations I usually have trying to compare the two, uh, many people, think when they think of uh, FGM, they think of amphib uh, amphibulation. Yeah. So their mind automatically goes to the most severe um, form happening in, you know, little dirt floor huts yeah. in third countries. And they don't realize that this is happening in doctor's offices in surgical environments. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the most common form is actually less invasive than um, circumcision no. yeah. of boys. Um, they still try to argue that it's not, you know, that FGM is way worse. Yeah. And they always, um, I'm always accused of making excuses or trying to downplay the effects of FGM. I'm like, yeah. no, like FGM is ab abhorrent. Like yeah. that's, it's terrible. Yeah. I'm not yeah. making yeah. a case for it. I am just trying to enlighten you on the uh, true horrors of male genital cutting and show you that it is the same. Yeah, yeah ethically it is absolutely the same. Yeah, and you know, and, and it depends on what you want to compare. I mean, you can compare physical harm and sure, amphibulation, that's extreme, absolutely. I don't think anyone can argue with you on that. But when it comes to ethics, it's the same. And when it comes to numbers, of individuals being cut. Well, male are cut five to one, the females. 
in the world. Yeah. Right? So there's a billion, over a billion men that have been cut, and there's what 200 million um, females cut. And supposedly that number is going down or might be going up because of the pandemic. I keep seeing lots of stories about you know an increased number of FGM cases because of the pandemic and all that. But yeah. And then the even the physical aspect, um, the the harms of it. Um, you know, you have infibulation where it's the most severe form and it causes all of these problems. But then you also, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't affect everyone. It's, um, but then you have the men that have the most severe forms. Uh, they're in pain, there's scar tissue that uh, prevents urination. You know, yeah. there's infections, there's skin bridges, like the, there are severe forms of male genital cutting as well. Yeah. Okay, so the next section is about social productivity. Um, you and I could be doing something completely different right now, probably being productive in other ways, right? But mm -hmm. unfortunately, because of this genital cutting stuff that's going on in the world, there's and activists like you and I that feel the need to speak out and try to put an end to it. Um, so that affects um, social productivity. And when you think about all the medical professionals that are performing these procedures, uh, doctors and nurses together, um, using PPE, you know, uh, personal protective equipment and all that to perform these procedures, wouldn't it be nice if they were spending that time and that uh, money and everything on fixing cancer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like I said um, in the beginning, it was I was spending a good six to eight hours a day um, researching and even just commenting on through Facebook, like talking to people. I would uh, spend a lot of time. Um, going through Brother K's posts and then jumping on those posts that he was sharing and mm -hmm. getting in debates with people. And then that just became, oh, that, that was exhausting. Like yeah, it is. got really fast having the same conversation over and over and people just not picking it up. Yeah. yeah I, when the American Circumcision documentary came out, I was elated because I, I before it came out, I wasn't really um, actively advocating. Um, I wasn't trying to convince people stuff like that. But you know, I, I looked at it. It's like you know, there's so much to know to understand about this. Uh, you have to kind of attack it from several different sides because of you know all the different layers of cognitive dissonance that people deal with, and you, know, you have to look at it from the related side, the medical side, the the cleanliness side, the you know the cultural side, all of it. And, um, and you got the debates back and forth. And it is very time consuming. And since the documentary came out, it's like, here, watch this, go have some popcorn and then come back to me <laughs> afterwards. I'm not gonna sit here and try to educate you by typing over and over and over again, spending hours trying to educate you. Go watch a fucking documentary. And it's, you know, nice and easy to do. You know, you can enjoy some popcorn or enjoy your dinner while you're watching it. It's not going to require a whole lot, you know, it's a, a, what, an hour and a half or 120 minutes, something like that, um, 150 minutes. Anyways, it's like, here you go, go watch it. So, yeah. Yeah, I've sent um, a lot of people to watch that, uh, but then they come back with, that was, that, that was too emotional, you know, is something I get. Oh, did, did they not like watch it all the way through or? Yeah, they say they did. I don't know, but they they said they it dealt with uh, emotions more so than um, the actual oh, logic. Yeah, so yeah. I was like, All right, well, here's Elephant in the Hospital. You can watch that one. <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe this is more on your level of information you're looking for. They there's Edgar Schoen and Andrew and um, Brian yeah, Morris. I yeah, I don't. Uh, know. And the and the documentary. And these guys are addressing it from their medical yeah. perspective. And even Andrew's talking about the you know the tribal Jewish or you know, tribal perspective, whatever. 
how is that just emotional? I mean, that's, that's addressing everything. Wow. Yeah, I thought it was a well-rounded documentary, but you know, yeah. some people didn't feel the same. Uh, yeah, it just kind of leaves you lost for how how can anything be structured in a way that takes care of all the all the people's excuses for doing it. I, yeah. I thought that the documentary covers it all quite well. Um, you know, you're you're hearing from the people that are promoting it. So uh, I I don't know how people take Brian Morris seriously. I mean. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, touch isn't important to sex. I'm like, what? <laughs> hey, man, you must have really gotten botched down there, dude, if you don't think that touch is important to sex. <laughs> I, I I haven't come across anyone that agrees with them on that. I, yeah. I don't care if you're pro <laughs> cutting or not. I mean, touch is important to sex. So. <sighs> okay. <laughs> uh, any other thoughts on on this topic that you want to share with the world? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Just really excited to see it gone yeah. away with. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, I, I hear that you know you you, you responded to my um, Facebook post about um, intactivists that feel burnt out. So I'm yeah. I'm hearing that you're that you've been burnt out. Um, to tackle this too. Um, oh yeah. Um, so I've uh, ventured away from Facebook and activism. Um, it's just too much. Like I still like even I fo I follow Brother Casto, but I have to um, mute him for thirty days at a time, uh, just yeah. because his posts. I mean, it's not his fault. I know yeah. he's doing it for a reason, but it's so mm -hmm. triggering, mm -hmm. and. Um, so I've moved over to Instagram and I will com leave a comment in inviting usually expectant mothers to uh, your whole baby. Um, so I can drop that comment and leave it. I try not to debate any or try not to debate anybody. Yeah. About it. Uh, so I just drop info, leave that seed there, hope they water it. Exactly. Um, I even... Um, like I'll leave, I take cards with me too. So that's uh, when I'm out and about, I'll put cards in like diaper boxes when I'm at the grocery store or um, I've even uh, put stickers onto Vaseline jars. <laughs> so I, do, I still try to uh, be active, yeah. just not in, in an engaging way with other people. Yeah. Um... One of the one of the stickers actually there's two um, stickers from your old baby is a, is about intact care and it's kind of designed to be put in places where you you're changing the diaper on on children and I mm -hmm. often in grocery stores so without going to the restroom and they'll have a changing table and I'll I'll slap a sticker inside of those yeah. and I have them go back and find it's still there you know many months later so it's like no one sees any reason to yank them off uh, so that's another way that people can um, right you know elevate. Mm -hmm the awareness of the issue. Another place I put stickers, and I know this is terrible, uh, but I put it on the carts, um, the ones that have the like little buggies for kids. Oh, like yeah. the fire station, so I'll put that on there. That idea. way parents are like forced to see that sticker. <laughs> Only one has been removed out of the many. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to share your Instagram um, page here? Um, I usually do it through um, uh, your whole baby. Okay. Um, yeah, but it is mine is Queen Tulip five one nine. Ah, there you are. You have another follower. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I I wonder. Uh, I you know, I'm on Instagram, but I don't use it very much. Um, I jumped onto TikTok fairly recently and started uploading tons of videos. I, I took uh, bigger videos and, and cut them out so they'd be fit the one minute requirement of, of TikTok. And I, I like the TikTok um, approach because you know, it's kind of more random. So chances that random people will see my videos is good. I don't, 
I don't want to put things out there that's just going to, you know, go into an echo chamber. I want to get yeah. out to the outside world. Um, and I don't feel like Instagram gives me much opportunity to do that. Maybe I'm missing a way to do use Instagram properly. Um, so I will follow um, hashtags like it's a boy or 35 weeks or expecting. Mm -hmm. um, that way it comes across in my newsfeed and then I can comment and and invite people to your whole baby or even to little images if I if I see a um, religious aspect on their page I'll invite them to them as well. Oh interesting so you just you can find you kind of like looking for a post on Facebook you know you just search for circumcision and you can find people posting about you know getting a child circumcised or whatever and you, you have that you know it's a public post so you have the opportunity to try to educate so on Instagram you can go in and search for these hashtags and mm -hmm. um, and come across opportunities to educate others. Yeah, and I like to follow the the ones that um, instead of the babies are already born, like I like to find them, you know, into their pregnancy. That way, they have time to uh, look it up, and it's not so last minute. They don't feel on yeah. the spot. They tend to be uh, more receptive. Cool, interesting. I'll have to start trying to do that some more. Maybe that's not yeah. more opportunity. I've been doing that for about a year, yeah. uh, and I've only had one person send me an angry message. <laughs> so I, I, on Facebook, I got a lot of angry messages. So I consider that a win. <laughs> so. You know, as an activist, we we run into a lot of you know angry messages and pushback and stuff like that frequently. Um, do you see um, thank you messages very often? Um, I will get thank you messages, but uh, more often I'll see a follow. Like so, I'll, um, I'll I'll make a comment, and then they'll like that comment, and then I'll see them that they followed your whole baby. Yeah. So I don't, uh, it's not a direct you, but I take that as the thank you. <laughs> cool. And there's a page called Thankful for Intactivists, if you're not aware of that. I'm not. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, at least, you know, it, it, you know, this, this is not a thankful thing to be act, advocating for babies unless you want to wait 15, 16, 17, 18 years down the road and maybe, <laughs> maybe hear about a guy that uh, is thankful that, you know, Intactivists existed now, <laughs> you know, years into the future. So you're not likely to hear from the babies um, and parents may or may not say thankful uh, and they're thankful for intactivists. I, for one, am very thankful. I, I am very thankful as well. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, hearing that thankful message from people, uh, might help diminish that burnout a little bit, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. All it takes is one comment. <laughs> yeah. Just one little seed. Yeah. So for all those people that are watching this video, if you're thankful for intactness, please comment down below. <laughs> all right, Robin, unless you have anything else that you want to add? Wrap this up? Um, I don't think I do. Okay. Well, thanks again. Thank you for your advocacy for genital autonomy. Thank That's you important. for these videos that you're providing for people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm. I'm excited to see how it uh, how it works out and how many people actually watch them. Unfortunately, it's not something that people go searching for very much. Okay, Robin. Have a great great day. You too. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.